Massachusetts Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, MOLST, by Dr. Amy Sanderson. Hello, my name is Amy Sanderson, and I'm an assistant in critical care medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, I'm going to be speaking to you about Massachusetts Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, also known as MOLST. Specifically, I'll be talking about concerns regarding the current state of advanced care planning for children with life-threatening diseases, what MOLST is, and why the change. Concerns regarding advanced care planning. Optimal care for children with life-threatening conditions requires effective advanced care planning. Parents of critically ill children believe that it is important to have honest and direct communication with health care providers as information given by the clinical team may influence their end-of-life decision-making. Furthermore, among adults, advanced care planning has been associated with end-of-life care consistent with patient preferences, as well as a better rating of the dying experience. However, advanced care discussions often happen late in the course of illness, and resuscitation status orders are frequently placed in the medical record near the time of death. Communication during advanced care discussions has been reported as suboptimal, and many times there is parental dissatisfaction with the process. In fact, parental perception of poor communication styles and insufficient transfer of information have led to poor quality of care ratings. Studies have shown that common barriers to pediatric palliative care and advanced care discussions include uncertain prognosis, differences between clinician and patient or parent understanding of prognosis, the patient or parent is not ready to acknowledge an incurable condition, language barriers, time constraints, and conflicts within the family. Recommendations to overcome these barriers include interdisciplinary collaboration to optimize care and increase clinician education, such as more formal courses in pediatric palliative care communication training, and hospice rotations. Another recommendation is to discuss palliative care in advance of critical illness because talking about treatment preferences earlier in the disease course may improve the patient and parent's ability to make these decisions later on. Furthermore, we really should integrate palliative and curative therapies. A dichotomous model that compels one to choose between curative therapies and treatment directed toward comfort is likely to be frustrating to pediatric healthcare providers, patients, and their parents. And finally, it may be helpful to accept prognostic uncertainty because it is an inherent part of medical care. An uncertain prognosis can create opportunities for enhanced communication. Now, we are briefly going to talk about do not resuscitate orders because they can be an important part of advanced care planning and discussions. DNR orders were developed as a means of inducing an informed decision by the patient on what procedures would not be implemented at the time of cardiac arrest. Indeed, the publication of the first DNR orders in the literature marked a significant transition in the delivery of medical care. Rather than initiating a therapeutic intervention, this was the first order prohibiting a specific medical therapy. The DNR order alone is insufficient for optimal advanced care planning. Why is that? Most patients and families need time to deal with the reality of approaching death. It is not recommended to use DNR orders to introduce dying. Furthermore, if clinicians discuss resuscitation status before understanding the patient or parent's overall goals of care, then the DNR discussion becomes a substitute for talking about overall goals of care. The problem with this is that confusion may arise if treatment preferences are not known, but rather inferred from a DNR order. Clinicians may incorrectly assume that a patient who agrees to a DNR order would also prefer to forego other medical therapies. Although patients who decline CPR may choose to decline other medical interventions, the DNR order is not intended to limit any therapies other than those that attempt to reverse a cardiopulmonary arrest. However, studies have shown that there is substantial variability in the interpretation of a DNR order. In theory, many clinicians believe that a DNR order should guide therapeutic decisions only during a cardiopulmonary arrest, yet in reality, care may change beyond resuscitative interventions. These challenges surrounding treatment preferences for patients with advanced illness led to the development of the MOLST form. Introduction to the MOLST form. 
The Commonwealth of Massachusetts recognized that there was a need to standardize the way in which patient preferences are communicated. Specifically, MOLST is a medical order form that converts a patient treatment preferences into medical orders. Why is MOLST important to our patients? Because MOLST is honored across all treatment settings and because understanding treatment preferences is especially important for patients who have progressive life-limiting illnesses. Why change to the MOLST? It's more comprehensive than the Comfort Care DNR form. It includes other life-sustaining treatment options in addition to resuscitation. There is less risk for misinterpretation of a patient's wishes, and it is a standardized medical order that crosses the continuum of care. Most forms are not the same as advanced directives. Why not? Well, because advanced directives are legal, not medical documents. Remember, MOLST is an active medical order. Also, advanced directives go into effect only after a patient is incapable of making his or her own medical decisions. Treatment preferences that are documented on a MOLST form are made by a person who is still capable of making medical decisions. MOLST forms are not the same as living wills either. Living wills are written documentation of a person's preferences. They are used to guide surrogates and clinicians if a person loses capacity to make medical decisions. A living will is not legally binding in Massachusetts. It is important to talk to all patients older than 18 years of age about signing a healthcare proxy. Before talking about MOLST, it is important to determine if a patient may be suitable for a MOLST form based on his or her current medical condition. One should consider patients with advancing illness due to a serious medical condition, patients who have a DNR order, and patients who have a pre-existing MOLST form but current treatment preferences are not accurately reflected. So when introducing the option of MOLST, engage in discussions with the patient, the patient representative, and other loved ones about the patient's condition, prognosis, values, and goals of care. Clinicians should explore expectations and hopes for treatment, especially what would be acceptable and unacceptable outcomes of treatment. Clarify that MOLST is a voluntary way to document and communicate preferences about life-sustaining treatments. Using the MOLST form. Now we're going to talk about some of the specifics of filling out a MOLST form. On page one, fill in sections A, B, and C to reflect treatment preferences. Then instruct the patient or patient representative to fill in section D completely. Fill in section E yourself, it is important to not only fill in the date you sign the form, but also to document the time. All medical orders must be dated and timed. Fill in optional information as instructed at the bottom of page one, if appropriate for the patient. For section F on page two, explain the uses, benefits, and burdens of each treatment and mark the treatment preferences or mark undecided or did not discuss. Instruct the patient or patient representative to fill in section G completely and fill in section H yourself. Don't forget to document the date and time that the form is signed. Physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants can fill out and sign a MOLST form with a patient. Once again, patients who might be suitable for MOLST include those of any age with advanced illness, including but not limited to life-threatening illnesses, chronic progressive diseases, medical frailty, and any patient suitable for considering DNR orders. When you encounter a patient with a MOLST form, honor the form as you would honor any other medical order. Alert appropriate clinicians about the existence and contents of the MOLST form, and contact the clinician who signed the patient's MOLST for more information if needed. Here are some points to remember after a MOLST form is signed. The original MOLST form stays with the patient. The most form should be placed where it can be easily located, such as on the refrigerator or at the bedside. The form should go with the patient to all care settings and during any trips or appointments outside the home. Family and caregivers should be informed about the most form, its contents, and where to find it. Copies of the most form are valid. All of the patient's health care provider should have an updated copy. Most forms should be updated any time there is a significant change in the patient's health status, level of care, goals of care, or treatment preferences, and patients can ask to change or void their most form at any time. Any change to the most form requires the form to be voided and a new form filled out. To void a most form, write void across pages one and two of the form, 
instruct the patient that all copies of the outdated form must be destroyed, and create a new MOLST form if the patient desires it. For more information about MOLST, please visit the Massachusetts MOLST website. Thank you very much for your interest in the Massachusetts MOLST initiative. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.